Now I'd like to pass the baton to Jane Waldbaum, former AIA national president and longtime member and officer of the Milwaukee AIA. She was the one who suggested Dr. Cahill for this uh, lecture program and will provide his introduction. Jane, take it away. Thank you, Jane. This is the Dueling Janes. Um, and I'd like to say um, great introduction. And I too am a long time member of the AIA since I was an undergraduate um, and that's more than 50 years ago. So, so I encourage everybody to join. It's a great organization and we bring you lots of good things. And now it's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker and his talk on the spectacular archeological site of Sardis. The site of Sardis in Western Turkey is especially close to my heart since I spent a couple of happy seasons there many decades ago, actually the summers of 1969 and 1973. At the time, I worked under the direction of Professor George Hontman of Harvard University, field director from 1958 until 1976. Under Professor Hontman, several major Roman and early Byzantine architectural monuments were unearthed and restored and many tantalizing forays were made into Sardis's deeper past as the capital of the Lydian Empire in the seventh and sixth centuries BCE, and even farther back into prehistory. Since Hontman's time, Sardis has been excavated almost continuously, and many more questions have been asked of and answered by this extraordinary site, now under the direction of our speaker for today, Professor Nicholas Cahill of UW-Madison. Nicholas Cahill received his BA in classical archaeology and Greek from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and his MA and PhD in ancient history and Mediterranean archaeology at the University of California at Berkeley. His main dissertation advisor was Professor Crawford H. Greenwald, Jr., who was field director at Sardis from 1976 until 2008. Greenwald was Professor Cahill's immediate predecessor as field director of the site. So Nick has a, an illustrious Sardis pedigree going directly back to Crawford Greenwald in the late 70s, not 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, back to George Hontman from the late 50s, 60s, and early 70s. Nick began his teaching career as assistant professor of art history at UW-Madison in 1993. He rose steadily through the academic ranks there and currently holds the Simona and Jerome Chazen Distinguished Chair in Art History where he teaches graduate and undergraduate courses on Greek and Roman art and related topics. His major publications include Household and City Organization at Olynthus, Yale University Press, 2002, a co-authored book on the city of Sardis, Approaches in Graphic Recording with Crawford Greenwald Jr., Philip Stinson and Fikret Yerul, Harvard Art Museums, 2003, and two edited books, Love for Lydia, a Sardis anniversary volume presented to Crawford H. Greenwald in 2008, and The Lydians in Their World, 2010. He has also authored and co-authored many articles, electronic publications, and encyclopedia entries, most of them on various aspects of the Sardis excavations. In addition, Professor Cahill has served as the Vice President of the American Research Institute in Turkey from 2010 to 2015, and since 2010, he has been series editor for the Sardis site publications. From 2008 until the present, he has been director of the archeological exploration of Sardis. He will speak to us today on Sardis, recent discoveries from the Bronze Age until the end of antiquity. Please welcome Professor Kay Holm. And I can, well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful, it's a pleasure to be here sort of virtually, I don't feel like it's it's hard to know where one is nowadays, in a sense. Um, uh, uh, but it but but I'm thinking of you in Milwaukee, not that far away and uh, and and um, wishing that we could get together for a beer afterwards or something. Um, let me let me start by just introducing and let me start by by um, seconding uh, Jane and Jane's uh, strong recommendation of the AIA as a wonderful institution that supports these these great lecture series um, and um, um, and and that you should all uh, if you are not members of the AIA uh, please do uh, do join Sardis 
was one of the great cities of the ancient world. It was famous as the place where coinage was invented, um, the motherland of the Etruscans in Italy, according to some ancient authors, and one of the seven churches of Asia. It's located at the edge of the Hermas Plain in Western Turkey, about um, an hour's drive or so from Izmir, in the foothills of the Tmolus Mountains. Um, it's a site, as you can see, of great natural beauty with the cliffs of the Acropolis gleaming gold in the morning light, rising above the fertile green plains below. And in antiquity, Sardis was prized for its many natural resources, its fertility, its forest, its defensible Acropolis, um, and most of all, of course, um, for its gold. Um, um, uh, and the Pactolus River burbled by the site and above all else brought Sardis fame because it ran rich with alluvial gold, making the inhabitants, the Lydians, the wealthiest people in the world and the inventors of the world's first coins. The gold ran out, but Sardis's fame as the golden city was never lost. Let me give a brief history here and focus um, uh, on and focused on some of the particular problems that now occupy our research. First of all, who were the Lydians? Um, in about 668 BC, a little after the time of Homer, say, Ajurbanipal, the king of Assyria in Iraq, the most powerful man in the world at the time, received an emissary at his capital at Nineveh. The stranger spoke a language that nobody could even understand, but he eventually explained that he came from Lydia and that they were threatened by nomadic horsemen from Central Asia called Chimerians. The Lydian king Gyges offered submission to the Assyrian king if the Assyrians would help them repel the, the invaders. In the end, the diplomacy led nowhere, the Assyrians sent no aid, and the Chimerians eventually swept through the land and Gyges was killed. At just about this time, one of the earliest Greek poets, a guy named Archilochus, boasted that he did not care for the wealth of Gyges, rich in gold. And this is sort of a common conceit among the Greeks who claim to be above mere lucre and to value friendship over coin. They weren't above taking um, dedications of six mixing bowls at Delphi from Gyges himself, which add up to about 780 kilograms of gold. So these two earliest literary sources illustrate the position of Lydia between East and West. To the Assyrians, the Lydians were this distant people beyond the Western limits of civilization, speaking an incomprehensible language, not worth sending an army all that way to support. To the Greeks, on the other hand, uh, the, the Lydians were prototypical Oriental monarchs living in unimaginable luxury, famous for delicately woven headbands and exotic foods and extraordinary generosity, and also for an irresistible cavalry that conquered most of the cities of the Ionian coast. The Lydians thus also stand on the border between history and prehistory. Gyges in the seventh century BC was the first properly historical character, Lydian character that we know of. But that's only because contemporary cultures either didn't know about them like the Assyrians or weren't writing very much, the Greeks. The, Greek, the later Greek geographer Strabo tells us that Sardis didn't even exist until after the Trojan War about 1200 BC. So for the period between 1200 BC and about 680 BC, we have only sort of fabulous stories about the so-called Heraclid dynasty founded by Heracles himself, who was enslaved by the Lydian queen Omphile and made him wear women's clothes while she held his lion skin in his cape, as shown in, these, in this um, 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 Sprenger uh, uh, painting, a wonderful reversal of gender roles encapsulating the, the Greeks' attitudes towards the Lydians as, on the other hand, Bar, on the one hand, barbaric and effeminate, but also powerful enough to overcome even the great Greek hero. But it's probably not history. Because Strabos told us that Sardis was only founded after the Trojan War at the end of the Bronze Age, scholars had concluded that the Bronze Age capital of the region, the re this, which was known as the Seha Riverland to the, um, to the Hittites, was not at Sardis, but was at another site nearby called Kaimakja, recently discovered on the shores of the Gygean Lake and now being excavated by Christopher Roosevelt. We'll see that that's a problem in a moment. 
when Sardis first appears in history in the seventh century, the Greek city-state was just developing. And so we had concluded that the Lydians developed more or less in step with the Greeks. But it's worth remembering though, that the Assyrians and other Near Eastern cultures like the Phrygians had been urbanized centuries earlier. So this is one of the questions that occupied Professor Hanfmann of Harvard when he founded the Sardis expedition in 1958. One of the first trenches that, Har that Hanfmann dug that year was in a sector called the House of Bronzes. And the discovery of the first Lydian occupation remains there was a, an occasion for tremendous excitement. Over the next 15 years or so, Hanfmann dug up small houses of the sixth century BC that you used to be able to see on the screen up here. And beneath those, and so earlier, he found rather larger but still very simple buildings of the 7th century about the time of Gyges and Ashurbanipal and Archilochus. Lower still, and in the 8th century BC, he found a destruction level long before our historical records with casualties and a lot of nice pottery and other artifacts. Professor Hanfmann dug deeper still, as you see in the photo on the right, and found earlier levels dating to the end of the late Bronze Age, about 1200 BC maybe, which accorded pretty well with Strabo's account that Sardis was founded just after the Trojan War. The remains were very simple, a hut and a burial, no signs of a great city, and so quite in keeping with what was going on in contemporary Greek settlements, not like the huge cities of the Assyrians and others. Well. When Professor Hanfmann excavated Hob in the 1960s, he thought that was the center of the Lydian city. He thought of it as a kind of bazaar or marketplace of the city ranged along the Pactolus River, where Herodotus described Sardis at the time of the Ionian Revolt. As Jane mentioned, in, um, in 1976, the year that Professor Greenwald took over as director, they found um, part of the Lydian fortification, which you see there circled on the right, or circled on the left, rather, um, at a sector called MMS. And, and Hanfmann, when he published his magisterial uh, synthesis of his excavations in 1983, he saw that as the eastern city wall of a city ranged along the Pactolus. Excavation in the 1980s and 1990s, however, the topic for another talk, proved that the center of Lydian Sardis lay to the east. They found bits and pieces of this wall ranging around to the east, and thereby proved that Hob and other sectors that Hanfmann had worked in was actually outside the Lydian city walls. That's the center, that's the subject of another talk but it completely changed our understanding of Hob and, of course, of the city as a whole. So that we now have turned our attention to the, what we now know is the center of Lydian Sardis, and particularly to a hill which we'll look at in a moment called Field 49 here um, in the center. Mr. Hoffman wasn't stupid or anything. How could he have made such a mistake? The explanation, I think, lies in the next phase of Sardis's history when in 547 BC, a new king, Cyrus the Great, was on the rise in Persia and hoping to add territory to his empire, Croesus, the king of Sardis at that time, asked the oracle at Delphi whether he should attack Cyrus. And the oracle famously and ambiguously answered that if he did, he would destroy a great empire. So Croesus set out, but was defeated by the new Persian king and his city was captured and burned. And so he fulfilled the oracle by destroying his own empire. We've excavated dramatic remains of this sack of Sardis. Houses burned, soldiers slaughtered and left in the rubble, the fortification deliberately demolished. These destructive events are great for archaeologists since they preserve so many artifacts and we get this detailed lives. Look at the lives of ordinary people which were interrupted so suddenly that we find cooking pots on hearths still filled with grain, for instance, or this soldier who was killed violently and still had a tiny silver 24th stater coin found near his head and as well as his helmet there. What happened next though when the Lydians were no longer masters of their world but part of a larger empire? We had always assumed that Sardis continued just as it did before but just under new management, that the Persians moved into the palace and ruled from there. But the archaeological record reveals a very different story. It turns out that the walled city was entirely abandoned. 
here, for instance, you see the bit, bits and pieces of a Lydian house, and I hope you can see my mouse there, sort of partly excavated here, and then um, destroyed uh, by Cyrus. And this this was full of of artifacts that we that were that I'll show later. Um, and and then the next activity on this spot, the next occupation, is the Hellenistic theater in green there, about 180, 160 BC. In the intervening centuries between 547 and 160 or so, um, although this was a major regional capital with a powerful governor and a strong garrison, the ancient city lay fallow. And this is a pattern that we've seen over and over everywhere we've dug at Sardis. Some of their population in 547 was probably removed to Iran and elsewhere. Others were scattered through the countryside where we find a dramatic increase in the number of small settlements and estates, um, a deliberate dispersal of population. At Sardis itself, although we find no trace of Persian period occupation within the Lydian walled city, we do find occupation along the Pactolus River, for instance, at Sector PN and Hob, exactly where Herodotus described it. Alexander the Great took Sardis in 334 BC, and the city center was then reoccupied, and monumental buildings, maybe a Hellenistic palace at this western capital of the Seleucid, the, the, um, one of the, the Hellenistic Seleucid Empire, was built from blocks salvaged from the Lydian structures. The city's transformation from a Persian capital to a Lydian to a Greek polis was the study of a special subject, special study uh, led by Andrea Berlin and Paul Cosman. The great, the greatest monument of this period, of course, is the Temple of Artemis, which was the subject of another research project lasting for more than 30 years, which we'll look at in a moment. Vikret Yegul drew every marble block of the temple and wrote this wonderful account of this magnificent building. And this was finally published um, just a couple summers ago. Sardis joined the Roman Empire in 133 BC, but the really profound change in the city, the real Romanization, comes a century and a half later. Sardis, it's, a, it's got this wonderful location in the fertile, defensible spot, but there are disadvantages, such as being di located directly on a major fault line. And in 17 AD, a devastating earthquake struck the city um, uh, uh, and described at length by Tacitus. They very quickly rebuilt their city, however, with the help of the imperial purse. And among the public projects were the stadium, the reconstruction of the theater, and also a sanctuary of the imperial cult exactly in the center of the city with a huge temple lavishly decorated with relief and freestanding sculpture and ornament. And we'll see more of that later again. This site remained important, um, although the temple was dismantled and its, and its remains were built into new buildings on the spot in late antiquity, one of many cases where the Sardians recycled their own past. This is another of our major research interests, the later days of the city when the world was undergoing these dramatic changes from the pagan world of imperial Rome to the Christian world of Byzantium. This settlement too, was destroyed by another massive earthquake in the early seventh century. The roofs and walls collapsed, leaving the inhabitants crushed in the rubble. Uh, buildings around the site tumbled like dominoes. And after the earthquake, there's no sign of major rebuilding. After thriving for millennia, Sardis was no longer a city, but it did remain an important site. In the early Byzantine period, the inhabitants fortified the Acropolis, hauling blocks from the wrecked ancient buildings up the steep slope to build these tremendous fortifications. And we're just beginning a new project to understand Sardis in this post-antique period. So let me start then with some of our work on the Lydian city, in, and particularly on a hill in the center of the Lydian city called Field 49. One of the most striking features of Lydian urbanism is the way they enclosed natural hills with monumental terraces built of giant boulders or gleaming white limestone masonry, which regularized, organized, and separated this region from the lower city. This radical transformation of the natural landscape is quite unlike contemporary Greek urbanism or Near Eastern urbanism for that matter. When these terraces were discovered in the 1980s, we believed that they were outside the Lydian city. But when we learned that, they were, that this was actually the Lydian city center, those terraces were clues that this region was part, I believe, 
of the palatial quarter of the city. So that's where we've been working for since 2009 or so. Cuisine Eren, for instance, of Boston University is bravely dug on the steep and windy, windy north slope of this hill for nine seasons. She exposed a terrace wall made of huge boulders for a length of more than 45 meters, um, the most conspicuous monument of Lydian architecture at the city, city site. A lot of her work has been to understand the date of this of this wall. Parts of it date from the 6th century BC, rather late in the Lydian period, but other parts seem to date much earlier in the 8th century, when we thought, remember, that Sardis was only a village. In her dissertation, she, she, she makes a, the, the strong argument this, that this is an early 8th century BC Lydian terrace that was largely rebuilt using the same stones. Again, this sort of confusing recycling of earlier remains. And that's eighth century pottery that she's got. Down the slope of the hill, she's got two more terrace walls. One of them is 16 feet thick, solid stone with a white limestone face, unfortunately, mostly removed, but you can see little bits of that face here. Um, a monumental task transporting that limestone from quarries eight, not eight kilometers away at Bintepe. And this was further ex expanded by a sandstone faced section. And these, these, um, this new terrace wall dates to the late seventh or early sixth century BC, the, the period of Sardis's greatest expansion. We wanted to find a little more of this to find out to learn more about it. And so she followed the wall westward a few, a few years ago, but there found that it had been entirely robbed out after the Persian conquest in 547. And this again adds weight to the, that observation that the city center lay abandoned during the Persian period, quarried for stone and valuables and only reoccupied after Alexander's conquest. Another goal of working here was to, was to learn about the buildings that these terraces supported. Um, unfortunately, like the terrace walls themselves, most of the Lid later Lydian buildings, which were built out of beautiful material, marble and, and limestone, have been entirely robbed out here to reuse their blocks in later structures. But in 2013, well below the 6th century BC levels, 23 feet deep, Guzin found a thick mud brick wall, which you see there on the right, with gaps for massive wooden posts. A few years later, she found the corner of this building and so could reconstruct it as a room about five by five meters, 16 by 16 feet, and continuing to the south and east, probably. Its enormously thick walls and post holes suggest that it was a tall and substantial structure, much more than an ordinary house, some sort of monumental building. And carbon-14 and pottery, pottery from just last summer suggests that the building was constructed in the 9th century BC and destroyed in the late 9th or early 8th century. This is then strikingly early in that mythological period of Sardis's history and well before Greek settlements were monumental or urbanized. It is, in fact, our earliest monumental architecture at Sardis. Extensive robbing, as I say, had removed all the 6th century, all the later Lydian structures from this area, but we've been more fortunate in a trench to the south, sort of in the middle of this hill. Um, this hill, as I say, was prime real estate for all of Sardis's long history, and Will Bruce of, the, of Kansas has uncovered layer after layer of interesting and important buildings. After that long Persian gap, for instance, the Hellenistic builders returned to this hill and built massive structures out of reused Mar Lydian marble and limestone blocks, like this pa pa platform or terrace and a huge foundation that he's standing by here, built of limestone blocks weighing up to a ton. These extraordinary structures suggest that in the Hellenistic period, when Sardis became, as I said, the Western capital of the Seleucid kingdom, this hill may have been converted back to a palace quarter. The reused blocks are also important evidence for the construction of the Lydian structures here, finely dressed marble blocks rather than the more common, common limestone that's used for terrace walls and gates. In 2017, we'd uncovered a small stretch of beautiful limestone masonry still in situ, missed by those robbers, the kind found in elite terraces and just what the palace should be made of. Just as exciting as this in 2017 was a small area of burned floor dating to the middle of the sixth century and with three arrowheads on it, which we wondered whether this could be the remains of the Persian sack of 547 BC. As I said, it, 
you know, this destruction, these destruction levels have been found elsewhere at the site and well preserved, even at the theater here, um, uh, by, by thick layers of debris which protected the destruction surface and all the artifacts on them. And so we get these beautiful assemblages of artifacts in sealed in a sealed context. And so we wanted to find more of that destruction level. Finally, after years of work, uh, we reached it last summer. And as I say, it because this is such a complicated site with so much continuous occupation, we had to spend years carefully excavating, recording, and dismantling the maze of Hellenistic and Roman strata, uh, which, which were built on top of this. They just went down and down. And then, of course, we got the pandemic. Uh, but last summer, we finally were able to expose a little more of this wall, which, of course, immediately changed construction from limestone to coarse sandstone. We don't quite understand the architecture here, but it may have been some sort of a gate or entrance to the terrace, flanked on one side by white limestone and on the other by a rough wall made of schist blocks. There's a small mud brick platform, which Will Bruce is looking at here on one side, which we don't quite understand. There was so little collapsed debris on top of this floor, the Hellenistic occupation came almost down to the top that I didn't really expect to find much on it. Um, but we did find, he did find something like 30 arrowheads scattered on the floor in that passageway, apparently the remains of that final battle between Cyrus and Croesus. Um, and as he dug a little bit further, um, uh, discovered a wonderful lump, rather enigmatic lump of bronze, which um, upon cleaning turned out to be part of a monumental bronze sculpture of some feathered creature made of hammered sheets and, um, um, and, and hammered and cast sheets held together by rivets. I like to think of this as a griffin or some other monster, but we're not quite sure what it was. It's only, as I say, a small piece. There's sort of this adage that, you know, everything happens on the last day of excavation. And this year is the second to last day of excavation. And I was surprised when Will phoned me and told me to come out. He found a little bit of bone that might be human. We texted the photographs to anthropologist Yilmaz Erdal, who, con who confirmed that they were human. And a little bit later, Will uncovered an iron knife associated with the bones. You see him excavating here. And I, I just, and, and at this point, one of the workmen, you can see it here, calls Will over. I just happened to be filming at the time um, um, and noticed something different. Sadly, I turned the video off just at this moment and went over to see what they had found. So I missed Will's high fives as he realized that he had found two silver coins, large creased staters. And these are quite rare at Sardis. A bit more cleaning exposed seven more smaller coins in a pocket of loose earth, probably the remains of a cloth or leather bag in among the bones. And you can see some of those bones here. That's somebody's arm bone here. That's part of the knife. There's the end of a shoulder blade up here. This is either the radius or the ulna, I can't remember which. There's little bits of hand bones over, excuse me, over here. So we've got sort of somebody's arm stretched along here, a knife by it, and this horde of Lydian coins. Although they haven't yet been cleaned, as I say, this is the last day of excavation, um, we anticipate that as, and we had to continue excavating for another few weeks, and poor Will had to put off his departure and actually teach his first classes from, from Sardis um, while he finished the excavation. We think that this hoard was all creases, two, satyr, two staters, four twelfths, and three twenty-fourths. Um, found together with its owner in the historic context of the sack of Sardis, it's this really dramatic discovery, the first hoard of Lydian coins that we found at Sardis since 1922. We don't know anything yet about its owner, um, and the state of the bones is so poor that we probably won't learn a whole lot, but we will have the anthropologists look at that this summer. Next summer, I mean, inshallah. It's hard to know quite what to make of this complex, which we haven't really found, been able to uncover very much of, of the Lydian period. But here on the edge of the hill, it could be an entrance. And the situation is sort of reminiscent of the entrance to the palatial co complex at Kerkenes Da, a wonderful Phrygian site in central Turkey, um, also destroyed at exactly this same time in the middle of the sixth century BC. 
at Kerkenes, they've got um, a, a, a monumental entrance to their palace complex uh, with 10 meter wide doors, small platforms on either side, sort of like our mud brick structure, and sculptures, including winged griffins and sphinxes guarding the entrances. So there are sort of reminiscences, but this is all probably just made up anyway. Another surprise of the last few years was the discovery of occupation and terracing here long before the Lydians. In 2017 to 2019, we dug two deep sondages into the Lydian terrace fill, the, the dirt that these terrace walls um, supported and which raised and leveled the, um, this hill to support later occupation. Uh, and we wanted to learn more about the history of terracing here. Will dug through something like five meters, 16, 17 feet of, of sand and gravel, which you can see here, brought in to raise the level of the hill. He kept going, however, in a small sondage of only sort of scary sondage, a couple meters wide. And under this Lydian terrace field, he found occupation levels of the Bronze Age with unusual nosed pots and other characteristic shapes of the second millennium BC. This shows that the hill was occupied much earlier than Strabo and the other Greek authors believed. He dug about a meter of those occupation deposits in blue there, and underneath that found another four or five meters of almost sterile gravel sloping steeply down to the west, almost exactly identical to the Lydian terrace fill above. That is, he found an earlier terrace, showing that the hill was already terraced in the Bronze Age. Eventually, um, 14 meters below surface, the height of a five-story building, he reached bedrock, which you see there on the, on the right, sloping, on the left rather, sloping steeply down to the west. Our pottery experts, Peter Pavuk and Fulia Deda Olu, studied the ceramics from this sondage and concluded that the terrace dates to the early bronze 3B period, about 2000 BC, while they dated pottery from the occupation layers to the late Bronze Age, suggesting a gap in occupation. But this is the first time we've ever found stratified Bronze Age pottery at Sardis, and so the shapes are not that well known. Um, so last summer we did again a series of carbon-14 dates, and these show that the terrace is indeed er early Bronze 3, about 2000 or a little earlier. You can see some dates in the 2300s, 2100s there, 2100, 1955 up there for these terrace fill. But the occupation stratum also dates from the very early second, second millennium BC and seems to end um, in, the, in the mid second millennium or so without that awkward gap, but suggesting that our pottery chronology is a bit off. And I must, I must stress that this is very preliminary. The ceramicists are, have to go back and restudy the pottery with these new carbon dates in mind. And we also have another batch of carbon dates um, that are being analyzed right now and I'm just waiting on the, um, on the results of those. Another surprise from the carbon dating was that a mud brick wall that we'd found in 2013, and at the time was not Lydian as we thought, uh, but Bronze Age, contemporary with those Bronze Age occupation layers. The, we found this heavily burned wall, but with almost no pottery associated with it. We're very familiar with mud brick uh, Lydian walls at this time, and so we and we had no idea that there even was Bronze Age occupation here. So this is now our one piece of Bronze Age architecture at the site. So now we're forced to reconsider that hypothesis that the Bronze Age capital of this region was at Kaimakcha, and that occupation at Sardis only begins late in the Bronze Age or early in the Iron Age, as Strabo wrote, and as the archaeology as understood by Professor Hanfman, seemed to confirm. Now it looks like Sardis was an important city as well, um, uh, in the Bronze Age as well. Um, in addition, it changed how we understand the natural landscape and the urban, very urban development of Sardis. Geologists had told us that this was a naturally flat-topped hill, and so a convenient place to settle. We now find that bedrock here um, slopes very steeply, and in order to make it habitable, you would have had to build these huge terraces. And this was already done a thousand years before the Lydian period. So just as the Sardians in the, in the Roman period lived in an already ancient landscape and could point to great monuments of their ancestors, which had shaped the very city that they lived in, the Lydians too inherited an already built environment. 
Our excavations on Field 49 then have contributed greatly to our understanding of these earliest periods of Sardis as well as the later. The hill was densely occupied in the Roman era as well, but as we've seen, the remains from that period are not that well preserved. But a lower terrace offers important insights into Roman Sardis and um, into Roman Sardis. In 1981, we discovered the corner of a temple, which we called the Wadi B Temple, and we thought that it was the temple of the imperial cult. We returned to the area in the early 2000s to put the temple in a larger urban context. And we learned that it did not stand on its own, but was part of a great sanctuary or um, sanctuary terrace, part of that replanning of the city after the earthquake of 17. However, this temple, one of Sardis's most important sanctuaries, was deliberately dismantled at some point and its fragments reused in late Roman constructions on the east side of the terrace over here. Um, for instance, we found these Corinthian capitals from the temple decorated with human and animal figures, blocks from its architraves, hundreds of architectural blocks and fragments of sculpture and inscriptions from this sanctuary, which give us a remarkable picture of the temple with its lavish sculptural ornament, and also the dedications by prominent Sardian citizens and groups. These inscriptions were published just in 2019 by Georg Petzl in a new corpus of inscriptions found um, since 1958 by Professor Honkman and Greenwald as well. And we've got, and this has been a really a great success. For instance, um, Peter Thoneman recognized that one of my favorite inscriptions, a really scrappy piece of junk here that you would think would be nothing, uh, turns out to be a, um, um, uh, an ancient Lydian chronicle or Lydian history, which, which, uh, which tells stories or which, which gives dates for uh, noted events since Sadiates and something, one of the kings of Lydia and children, he ruled. Ardes, the name of another king of Lydia, and so forth. Um, we don't, we've got very, very little of this, obviously, and I would, you know, give a lot for the rest. Um, what was that sculpture, that, that structure, rather, that had been built out of these inscriptions and architectural fragments? Um, years of deep excavation, which you see here, finally exposed a wall built entirely out of reused marble architectural fragments and statue bases and inscriptions. The wall comes to a nice neat end here, and then we've got a road um, uh, passing north-south along here with a gate in it. Um, and the gate, and then the wall continues on the other side, just barely visible over, um, over here. What then is this, sol is this two meter thick solid stone wall? It must be, a, I, I think, with a gate in it, it must be a previously unknown early, late Roman, um, late antique fortification wall that protected central Sardis in the troubled times of the fifth and sixth centuries AT AD. Another major transformation of the city, um, which you see sort of reconstructed tentatively there. This fortification then collapsed in that massive earthquake of the early 7th century AD, leaving the blocks stacked like fallen dominoes and a number of inhabitants crushed, as I said. That same earthquake split the ground more than nine meters deep and has been found in the rest of the city as well. Unlike the earthquake in 17 AD, 600 years earlier, which must have been just as damaging, they didn't clean up afterwards, but they left the city in ruins. We've been interested in this earthquake, of course, and uh, the geophysicists who have been working there um, have been have been um, trying to explore it through um, through geophysics. Last summer, they found the fault sort of right here where the lines all sort of come together. Um, and we hope to work on that more next summer to understand this, um, understand the geology of what's going on here. This earthquake also destroyed Roman, um, Roman houses on top of the terrace and opening onto that street. One room opening onto the street, um, something like a taverna, um, was full of interesting objects, a number of marble tables, a bronze and glass polycandelon, bronze vessels, very like the ones that Professor Honkman had excavated, as well as, as I said, those casualties, their bones burned and shattered. The remark, the stuff is remarkably similar to finds from that Mr. Honkman found at the Byzantine shops in the 1960s. And now we believe that those were destroyed by this earthquake rather than by marauding Persians, as Mr. Honkman and, and Clive Foss and others had argued. 
On top of the hill, we found late Roman houses, leaving which had also been burned and destroyed, um, leaving dense layers of collapse, which protected their contents. We seem to have parts of two houses. One house to the south here has uh, nicely painted and tile floored rooms, the paintings imitating marble revetment, one of them. And um, it's, it's not a shower curtain, it's some sort of ancient tapestry or something up above in this room. Um, and with a remarkable collection of iron swords, bronze weights, glass vessels, and lots of other artifacts. It was clearly occupied at the moment of destruction. The house to the north, on the other hand, was entirely different. This too had collapsed. Um, for instance, one wall falls into the neighboring room, preserving its um, three arched windows. And I had sort of dreams or nightmares about what we'd find when we lifted that collapsed wall. Did it fall onto people at dinner, crushing their bodies on the floor? Unfortunately not. Um, when we got to the floor beneath, it was completely bare. The house was apparently abandoned before the destruction. To the west of this area was a marble paved courtyard and along the east of this and maybe along the other walls as well are raised platforms supporting basins. Its walls were also painted very like the, those of the rooms to the south, maybe even by the same crew, but again this room was empty of contents. Last summer, um, when we excavated the western part of this court, we found a stylobate here with, um, you can see the columns falling, falling from it and the capitals and, and a Corinthian capital here, an Ionic capital over here, reused from earlier buildings, presumably with a, with a, um, a wooden roof. However, you'll see that this all this massive collapse here ends at this point, and the floors have been cut through by some sort of a big pit that's been dug through the collapse, probably to extract marble blocks from the floor and other features here um, under the shelter of the room. Um, of the roof rather. This is really interesting and important new evidence for the occupation and again the sort of recycling at Sardis after the earthquake during the very little known early Byzantine period after the after that earthquake has left this lower city in ruins. And we found really interesting um, artifacts associated with this later sort of salvaging here. A lead seal of a guy named Marturios, the Metropolitan, identical to one in Dumbart notes dated to the seventh century, a buckle found deep in the salvage pit and these two lead amulets. And these lead amulets show on, um, on one side, um, 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 uh, on one side a face here within a circle, within a cross, and then snakes heads coming out of it. Um, similar amulets bear, uh, identified this motif strangely enough, you wouldn't think this, as a uterus. And they, they read, for instance, the, the inscriptions on them read things like womb, black, blackening, as a, as a snake you coil, as a serpent you hiss, as a lion you roar, and then as a lamb, lie down. So it's telling the womb to be quiet. The other side shows the holy rider led by a saint and spearing a fallen female demon who is identified occasionally as Abidzu or Gailu or something. Who are, This is a barren, a, a childless demon who, who, who harms pregnant women and young children in sort of in envy. Such amulets might be intended to protect the wearer from the dangers posed by the so-called wandering uterus as it was conceived in antiquity, which apparently affected both men and women, oddly enough. Anyway, so interesting stuff from these later levels as well. The date of the robbing is hard to pin down, maybe late in the seventh century or the eighth, and I'd suggest that it's connected with the construction of the Byzantine walls on the Acropolis, which, as I said, were constructed entirely from spolia, mostly from the lower city. So at this point, it seems that the late antique spolia wall was entirely robbed out and sort of moved up to the Acropolis. This is the third, at least the third use of those blocks. We find people salvaging marble from the bath, the temple, and every other marble building we know of, and then lime kilns producing mortar to build these huge walls on top. And the Acropolis is the um, subject of another recent survey by Ben Anderson of Cornell and Jordan Pickett of the University of Georgia talk about that another time. 
While we focus on the ancient city, we also want to keep a broad perspective of the region around Sardis. The city had an enormous territory with marble quarries and villages in the mountains, cemeteries and scattered settlements to the north, west, east, and south, and a tumulus cemetery um, eight kilometers away at Bintepe. And we occasionally get dragged into unexpected projects. And this happened in 2019 when looters discovered a small Lydian tomb in the mountains about three kilometers away over here. Um, just a simple box made of marble and containing a skeleton. It had been plundered in antiquity. You can see how the bones have been shifted around here. Um, but the, the looters missed a few things, five beautiful gold beads and a beautiful gold ring dating probably to the fifth century BC. And these give us a, a, a sense of the extraordinary gold work that was available at Sardis at this time. The bones belong to a very, very old woman of between 35 and 60 years old with osteoporosis and severe osteoarthritis and interesting wear patterns on her teeth by using them in daily work, such as working fabric or leather. And that's our um, um, the anthropologist Yilmaz Eridal and a couple of his students studying them a couple of years ago. I wanted to finish briefly by talking about some of our site conservation projects of recent years. I mentioned the Temple of Artemis, excavated a century ago, and again, just republished by Fikret Yegul. But in the century since Butler's excavation, the temple had turned dark and ugly, stained by black cyanobacteria and crusty lichen, which not only discolor the stone, but also eat away at it, causing permanent damage. So when the conservator at um, uh, one of the conservators at Sardis, Michael Morris, suggested that we could clean this bio growth from the temple, I sort of scoffed at it, thinking of crews scrubbing the marble blocks with toothbrushes. But he then developed a new technique um, for killing the microorganism. They, he doesn't like to call it cleaning because it's really not. It's disinfecting the temple of these microorganisms which cause this damage. The process is deliberately slow and low tech using a common and safe commercially available biocide to kill the bacteria in a very carefully controlled manner. It's much more long lasting. Over the years, we've tried other chemical and mechanical means of removing the, the guck, but after a few years, the bacteria start to grow. So when we began this project, we employed for the first time women in our field crew, and they took the project completely into their own hands, assembling the scaffolding, working fearlessly six stories above the ground, and returning the temple to its former rich glow. This has been one of the most satisfying projects that I've done at Sardis, and it's important as well to the team of 14 or so women and men who brought it to a su successful completion. They worked under very difficult circumstances on vertiginous scaffolding and made sure that every aspect of the project with, was a success, and they speak with real, real pride about their work. The other area of site conservation is in the western part of the city where Professor Hantmann began. Hanfmann had excavated and then restored an enormous bath gymnasium complex with a great marble court, which you see restored here. And next to that is a synagogue, this building here, the largest in the ancient world, paved with 15,000 square feet of mosaic, its walls revetted with colored marble and with a colonnaded forecourt. The reconstruction of the bath gymnasium and synagogue was the first major reconstruction under project undertaken in Turkey and is still the sort of iconic attraction of Sardis attracting school children and weddings and tourists from all over the world. The restoration of the synagogue in particular was one of Hanfman's great achievements as, um, as director overseen by the legendary conservator Larry Majeski. Following the best practices of the day they lifted all the mosaics and reset them in, wait, sorry, let me just put that again, and reset them in concrete. And so, which you see here, these concrete panels, and so made this one of the very few ancient buildings where you can safely walk on the original mosaic pavements. The experience is unique, but despite the best efforts of 1960s reinforced concrete, the mosaic has begun to deteriorate. Water enters through tiny cracks, causing the iron rebar inside to rust. It expands, which widens the cracks, causes further incursion until the mosaics finally fail. 
The only way to avoid inevitable destruction was to build a protective shelter roof over the building to keep the weather out. And this was one of the first projects that, um, that I took up um, when I became director. And uh, this wonderful team of architects and conservators and engineers and archaeologists had been meeting to find a solution to these problems since 2008. It took 10 years to design it, and then we had to get permission and raise the money. But finally, and this is a computer reconstruction of what they had planned, finally last summer we started construction. The roof has a steel frame and 22 meter, 22 meter wide uh, trusses. And, um, and this is, this is a, a photo, these are the photos and videos from earlier in the fall. And, um, um, and the, the cur you can see the curving trusses assembled on the ground and then lifted into place with an 80 ton crane, all done safely and without any damage to the building or any accidents or incidents. Just yesterday, I got these photographs uh, from Teoman, of um, who's overseeing this, of the um, of, of the, the canvas put in place. We now only have to put in the bird netting to keep birds from pooping on the mosaics, and um, and the and the project will be done uh, on time, under budget, um, and in the middle of a pandemic, which is something of an achievement. We also took the opportunity to clean the mosaics using that same technique that we used to clean the develop the Temple of Artemis, and um, and they now look gorgeous. Um, and the next step will be to start a project to remove some of these ugly concrete fills from the 1960s and replace them with new tessery to complete the patterns. Next summer, we'll begin developing a project that may take five or ten years. Um, to do this training that same team of of um, of women and men um, of local local workers um, uh, in mosaic construction and even a small amount of this will make, go a long way toward making the mosaics as colorful and vibrant as they originally were across the street is the lydian fortification whose discovery 40 years ago completely changed our understanding of sardis this has been under a temporary roof ever since, so nobody, not even members of the expedition, can see this most monumental structure. It's 20 meters, it's 65 feet thick at the base, still stands up to 50, up to 40 feet high. Um, you can see it, it, it remained un unexcavated, unrecognized, simply because it was so big. This is the hill here um, that, that it became. It was so big that it was thought to be just part of the natural landscape. We've had it, as I say, under a, under a, a temporary roof ever since excavation, because it's made, of course, of, of unbaked adobe brick, um, can't be left in the rain. But nonetheless, um, we've watched it be slowly damaged by humidity and rising damp. So that same um, team of architects and conservators has been designing a roof that will cover this as well. This is much more complicated because the mud brick needs not only a roof, but also something to cover it, to protect it from even the even exposure to air. And our, our plan is to do this with new mud brick, which will mimic the original size, color, and uh, texture and patterns of the originals. You can see it uses all these different colors and shapes of mud brick. We're going to reproduce that in modern material. And to test this out, a couple years ago, we constructed a shell against the, the wall where it had been cut through by the modern highway. And the, the sort of sticky outy bricks here are supposed to indicate that this isn't the face of the wall, but a section through it. And this, as I say, we built this a couple of years ago. It survived two winters. So we're pretty confident now that it's going to work. And we're going to start the work on the main face next summer. And again, I'm delighted to announce that or to say that this will this is now funded thanks to a very generous bequest um, from William Kohler. Uh, William Collins Kohler was again one of one of one of Professor Hanfman's students and an important member in the early years of the expedition in 1961. And this generous bequest will facilitate the protection of the mud brick fortification. And I hope that we'll be able to start building very soon. We still need to finish the design and get that, per that difficult permission. While we were doing all this, getting permission and so forth, we were doing a number of other smaller projects in this area, stabilizing things, making them comprehensible to visitors. The vast gymnasium complex and the synagogue are pretty easy to understand, but the maze of Lydian ruins, like the gate, which is over here, 
It was very difficult to understand. And so we decided a few years ago to open a little bit more of that colonnaded marble avenue, which you see here, the, here's the columns. Uh, excavated, by, excavated by Hanfmann, and we wanted to open a little bit more in this area um, to explain to, to visitors that there was a street here. Um, so Genjai Uzturk uh, started excavating, and it was supposed to be the easiest thing in the world, just dirt down to road pavement. But instead of road pavement, he started to find a few large, a few big marble blocks, and then a few more. And finally, um, he, he uncovered a mass of, um, of, of collapsed marble blocks, which turned out to be the remains of a monumental arch here at the western entrance to the city. This is something like 33, 34 meters wide, a central span of more than 12 meters. You see it restored at 1327 there, making it the largest arch in the Roman world. It probably underwent many phases of repair and rebuilding, one of the last of which was funded by a local benefactor named Myonius. And it then also collapsed in that earthquake that took out the rest of the city as well. Um, it would have completely dominated the landscape here, but interestingly, the Lydian Gate, which you see in this restoration here, was even more monumental. The collapsed blocks are so dramatic that I didn't want, I've resisted the urge to lift them, to study them for publication, but how then do we document them? So last summer we started a program to um, document them through a three-dimensional photogrammetric model of the entire pile, taking 30, 40,000 photographs, stitching them into a 3D model, documenting every surface to sub-millimeter accuracy. So for instance, this single model can then be cut up to remove individual blocks um, with, of course, blanks where the original surface isn't visible. And here you see one of the voussoirs of the arch. It's slanty this way. It's sort of trapezoidal in this direction with fascia, with this is the exposed face. You'll see that it, it's got all these other features on it, flutes here, because this was cut from a reused ionic column drum from the Temple of Artemis, another example of this continuous spoliation and reuse of blocks at Sardis is very strange. The photogrammetric model will also be useful in one final project we're working on. Um, um, the synagogue and Vatinasium, as I say, are pretty straightforward, but how do you explain the arch or the which is a pile of rocks or the Lydian gate, which is just one or two courses? Um, even archaeologists take a look at this and walk away completely confused. So what we're going to try to do is make an augmented reality app, which will overlay reconstructions and information on top of the view of your phone. And this is a very early prototype. The technology may be familiar to you. It's getting better every day. You think of, you know, IKEA or Pokemon Go, for instance. So architects and others have spent countless hours making 3D models of this site. And what we want to do is make these available to the public using this augmented reality, overlaying them on the building. And this is a photogrammetric model of the synagogue with the, um, as I say, this is a very early rendition. So, so the, the, the architraves came out bright red. And but you can see the arch there in the background, if I'd stop moving for a moment. Um, 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 and so forth. So rather than reconstruct them as solid facts, we're making them sort of ghostly translucent to reflect our uncertainty. There's a lot still to do, um, but you get the point. If you were at Sardis, you would only see the reconstruction hovering over the ruins as you walk through them. If you're home in Madison or Milwaukee or wherever, um, you also see a, re a 3D reconstruction of the site. We'll have um, annotations and links to the database and so forth. And it runs in a web browser which is really and will be multilingual. So I hope that you'll be able to visit Sardis, if not in person, at least virtually. All this research entails responsibility for publication. Professor Hanfmann had established two series of Sardis publications, the smaller monographs and the larger reports. Greeny brought out three reports and 12 monographs. And he and Greeny brought out three reports and 12 monographs, an enviable achievement, one of which, of course, is Jane Waldbaum's monograph on metals. Um, we're very fortunate in having a superb publication staff who continue this tradition. Carrie Sullivan joined us a few years ago, bringing with her decades of experience overseeing the publications of the American School of Classical Studies. 
and she joins um, architect and editor Brianna Bricker, who works remotely from Cyprus, and they're an absolute dream team here. So they redesigned the series with a modern layout. We've been working with Ege Yayanlada in Istanbul, a Turkish press that specializes in archaeological publications, to produce uh, books that would be prohibitively expensive in Turkey, such as the Temple of Artemis, which has uh, fold out plates. Um, um, uh, uh, you can see how, how big the original drawings are here, and and the, and these are these are drawn these are published now at fifty percent or so. That monograph was in the final stages uh, when the pandemic broke out, but they worked through the summer, and and with a bit of a delay, the book appeared in twenty twenty. Now available from Harvard University Press. Um, um, the House of Bronzes appeared last spring in another two volume report. Um, and is now also available. Um, the synagogue is what we're working on now, um, and we hope that that will be out in the spring. We're trying to produce about a, about a book a year or so. Andy Seeger has been working on this for many, many years and is joined by younger scholars, Marcus Routman, Jane Evans, and Vanessa Rousseau to bring this very complicated project to fruition. Um, and we're, and, um, um, uh, to fruition. And all of these are available, I should mention, on our website together with newsletters and a database and all kinds of other junk. So uh, if you want to know more about Sardis, it's sardisexpedition.org. And, um, and, and, and uh, you can visit us there. You can also subscribe for the newsletter and learn more, um, more that way. So I thank you very much for your attention on this snowy day and, um, and would be happy for questions if anybody is interested. Thank you so much, Nick. That was awesome. This is uh, Bettina. I'm going to be um, the disembodied voice reading the questions from the chat. So okay. you can just respond um, at, your, at your kind of leisure. And I'm going to work chronologically back from uh, a question from Justin Gleasing, who asked, uh, obviously, there have been major reasons for shifts in occupation, including warfare and earthquakes. Um, is there any evidence for climate shifts playing a factor in changes in occupation at the site? That's a really, really great question. And um, uh, yes, I believe there are. Um, the, 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 there's a big climate change that people know is reasonably well documented, not so well from Sardis, uh, but from but from other places. Um, big events about 2000 BC, and I would link. Although we don't have the evidence, we don't have any any climatic evidence from that. The fact of of a of a big shift in occupation from, from what we know now about that time uh, with the establishment of these terraces and and so forth. Uh, is is I think is I think very important. The other one is is the is what's going on in the late sixth, early seventh century A.D. And at that point, um, I think I, I showed you the Gygean Lake, um, which is across from uh, across the valley from from Sardis, and that lake seems to have dried up. And also, excuse me, in the sixth century A.D., people are drilling um, are are digging wells. There's we've got a number of wells dug um, during the late 5th and, and, and early 6th century. And those wells go very, very deep and uh, in, the Roman, in the Roman period. And um, um, you know, one of the reasons for digging wells like this must be that the, the Roman, the urban water system, which you know, the Romans were famous for and which we've traced, um, doesn't seem to be working as well. And so they're forced to look to other um, uh, to other um, other events, but that seems to be the late late antiquity um, is a period of lots of different problems, not only earthquakes, but also probably climate change and and you know and invasions and plagues, the famous Justinianic plague, for instance. Um, kind of reminds you of today, doesn't it? But anyway, um, um, yeah. So that that's a that's a really interesting question. We don't have as, as much evidence from that, partly because. Um, it's been a while. We've got a, we've got interesting pollen cores and so forth that 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 point to some of these things, but they're not as continuous as that from as some of those from other sites. But there've been some really there's been some interesting work that fits in very well with uh, what we're what we've been doing. Okay, great. Um, and Isabel asks regarding the ninth century monumental structure with the mud brick wall and post yeah. holes. Mm -hmm. um, 
destroyed in the late ninth century. Uh, is there a visible destruction layer or a clue as to natural versus intentional destruction? And based on finds, are you able to theorize as to the structure's function during the Iron Age? That's that's another really interesting question. There's there's very little material, very little pottery associated with that building, unfortunately. Um, and it's not clear why it's destroyed. There is a cross on the next hill. There's a very similar building, which I very similar with you know post holes and square and so forth, which has a lot of a lot of pottery associated with it. I would like to think that those buildings are contemporary. Um, and um, um, one of the reasons for the car for the big carbon fourteen thing last summer was to try to date that building as well. And the carbon fourteen came out. Um, was very screwy. There's something wrong there. Um, so I can't say that they're contemporary. That seems to be destruct, destroyed violently because it was found full of um, full of pottery. What the what the violence was, whether it was earthquake or um, um, or something else, um, um, is is not clear. There's a fallen mud brick wall uh, in it, which point which might suggest an earthquake, but um, Walls can fall over all the time for lots of different reasons. And earthquakes, you got to be really careful about, about identifying earthquakes. It's very easy to jump to conclusions um, that you've got an earthquake, and we try not to do that. OK. And Mike Gregory asks, um, how big is Bronze Age Sardis in terms of overall area? And where are you putting all the spoil um, from sort of back dirt and, and rubble? Um, Bronze Age Sardis right now is, is about two by two and a half meters. Um, that is, we haven't been able to, to penetrate deeply enough to get um, for most for most of the for most of it. So it's a big, you know, this is the problem. We can't even get to Lydian Sardis very easily uh, because because there's because we, we have to deal with with so much of. I'm, I'm just going to show this slide here. So so the only areas that we've been able to dig are this little hole here this area here and a very tiny area here. So it's just a few square meters. Uh, we haven't, we found Bronze Age pottery. We, there's a little bit of Bronze Age pottery at Hob. Um, there's, there, you know, we find bits and pieces at other, at other places, but we don't know, but unless you find it in situ, you don't, you, it might've come from anywhere. Um, so this is all very, very new. Um, and something we'll be looking at, but which again, you know, it's so deep. If you if if you look at this, for instance, I would really like to find this terrace wall. But if this is 14 meters deep, and this is sort of 10 meters deep or so, I mean, you've got to go through 10 meters then, or almost 10 meters of Byzantine, late Roman, early Roman, Hellenistic, more Hellenistic, more Hellenistic, and then the Lydian in order to get down to the Bronze Age, and and that is you know it's pra in practical terms it's very difficult so and the spoil where is that going i mean that's got to be our excavated our excavated material yeah oh we 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 carry it off with tractors um okay. and and um and it, it goes into a, a nearby stream bed or if it, right now the stuff from above goes into a nearby stream bed because it's too dangerous to bring it down the steep road. Mm -hmm. Other material, we, we, we move it to, um, I mean, from other places, we actually dig it up and, and people, um, um, people want it. Uh, they want it for filling, you know, for, for agricultural use. So we just give it away. Cool. Um, and then Jane Peterson, who could actually just unmute herself and ask, but she says, I'd love to hear a bit about how your recurrent themes of materiality and memory are expressed among the local folks that live around and work at the site today? How do they see themselves in relation to the site? Um, and obviously, uh, well, I'm not sure if that's part of the same question. Are materials still to be recycled, say from the Byzantine wall on the Acropolis? People do recycle things still. And, you know, despite our best efforts, um, you know, we've had to stop people, we've, we've had, you know, People will come up, for instance, to the Roman city wall, and they'll they'll pull stones out of it. They used to; they don't anymore, um, and and reuse them. And in fact, the way that the Lydian fortification was discovered was that people people wanted a good source of mud brick of, of clean clay for building mud brick walls for their house. And and um, 
Andrew Ramage had asked, pe asked people and they said, oh yeah, there's a really great source of very, very, very clean clay right over there uh, by the side of the road. And he went and looked at it and found that it was a mud brick wall. Um, so that was being recycled from mud brick to mud brick. Um, in terms of the, in terms of, of, of sort of memory, I, I, I absolutely believe that, that, the Lydia, that the Romans and others were very aware of, of that. Um, they made, you know, for instance, after the earthquake of 17, they make a, um, um, they make a plea to the Roman emperors saying that, you know, they're, they're, they're one of the most ancient cities in Anatol in Asia Minor. Uh, they, they, they talk about the ancestry of the Etruscans, which is another interesting, interesting story. Um, or the, the Lydians are thought to be the ancestors of the, of the Etruscans. Um, they, I, I love that inscription that recounts, you know, events from the history of Sardis in one of Sardis's um, most sort of revered sanctuary of the, of the Roman imperial cult. And that must have been very sort of deliberate and targeted too. Um, and then, of course, there's there's just the practical thing. I mean, I mean, there's the, you can make a lot out of the um, out, out of that sort of symbolism. There's also a practicality that it's much easier to recycle a block or a or just a, just an ordinary stone uh, from um, um, uh, you know from another building than it is to quarry a new one and carry it down from the from the marble quarries, which are quite a lot higher. Uh, is uh, they're pretty close. They're only four or five kilometers away, but they're quite hot. They're they're much higher, um, and and so the road is very steep or limestone from Bintepe or something. So it's just you know, there's a practicality to it as well. Um, and the modern people, you know, I don't. They're proud of their site. I don't think they see themselves as the. Um, so much as they don't think of themselves as Romans or Lydians or anything. Um, they're Turks, mm -hmm. and and their identity is really is something is is really is as is, is 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 one of is is one of that culture and 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 the people that they're digging up mm -hmm. are not their ancestors so much, which is sometimes a good thing because we do encounter a certain number of human remains of various kinds, and that doesn't. There is, we don't have the kinds of problems of sort of ancestry um, in Turkey that uh, dealing with, an, the, with one's ancestors and with human remains um, that one does elsewhere. We're able to deal with them as you know, scientific, from a scientific yeah. perspective. Yeah, that, I was wondering about that. Um, yeah. So, and then someone asks um, whether there have been any other discoveries relating to the religion of the Lydians um, at the site. Um, Interestingly, we have very few religious structures so far. Um, we've got um, there's a, there's a couple of altars. There's bits of a temple that were Hellen the, the temple is Hellenistic um, and reused in the synagogue, oddly enough. But we've got dedications uh, dating to the Lydian period. We don't know where the original building was because again, it was used. It's all reused as folia in the synagogue. Um, one would, you know, we always expected, everybody always expected that um, uh, that the, there would be a Lydian temple because Croesus is, is famous, among other things, for, you know, all these dedications at Delphi and also at, at, at Ephesus. He's the one who, can, who gave the money to construct um, many of the columns of the temple of Artemis at Ephesus. Uh, and, and there's even an, an, an inscription in Lydian. Uh, that was found there and is now in the British Museum. So we always thought, oh, there's going to be a Lydian temple of the time of Croesus, and there isn't a hint of it. And it makes me think that, not and, and not for lack of looking, um, um, I mean, either at some place completely different, which is perfectly possible, or it's been completely taken away, which is also possible, or it simply looked very different from what we expect. And um, the Lydians are very strange. They're not there. We often talk about them as if they're sort of Anatolian related to Hittite. Um, the person who knows the language best, I think, is, is persuaded now that it really doesn't have very much to do with Anatolian languages and that its deity structure, its, its divine, the, the structure as deities is also quite sort of quite, quite anomalous. 
Um, and they've got these uh, anyway. So, you know, they've got Artemis, uh, for instance, but her, the Artemis that they have, we've got, there's a wonderful relief that seems to depict um, Artemis of Sardis, and she looks like a pile of furniture. She's not even, she's not anthropomorphic. Interesting. So, um, so it may have been quite something quite different. And, and then, you know, there is this interesting um, um, sort of, sort of deliberate effort on the part of many ancient cultures to, to make links between their deities and say, oh yes, your Zeus is the same as our something or other. Um, and, uh, and, and so, and so the, you can't necessarily follow things like names and so forth for, to back too far. Anyway, that's a big question, the Lydian religion. Excellent. Okay, well, um, on behalf, I guess, of, of all of the attendees, and, and uh, we'd really, we really uh, would like to just thank you for a terrific presentation. And I think Jane Peterson can presumably reinforce that. That was really, really terrific. Oh, thank you. Yes, it was really great. Thanks so much. And thanks to Jane Waldbaum as well for uh, suggesting that I make the invitation. So uh, we really appreciate your time and insights and uh, look forward to hearing more about Sardis in the future. Thank you so much. Look forward to being back and All right. maybe doing it in person next time. <laughs> That'd be lovely. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you.